So as parents, we are really familiar with individual advocacy. We do that almost daily sometimes for our kids, right? Um, and certainly when we're at the IEP team table, most of that is probably individual advocacy. And what I would like to challenge us to do today is to think about what are those topics, what are those concerns and issues that you continue to bring up at IEP meetings that maybe could be shifted and it could be something that we look at collectively advocating for and making bigger systemic changes. So welcome to our show today. We'll be talking about individual advocacy, but also collective advocacy, and especially at the school board level. We'll be looking at that today. If you are new and haven't met me before, I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm a parent, retired teacher, author of a book. And I thought, you know, we haven't given away a copy of my book in a while, The Art of Advocacy. So we'll be doing that today at the end of the show. Remind me if I forget. <laughs> um, and also, I would like us to just be a little bit open-minded today um, because I know that collective advocacy isn't something that you may be interested in right now. But hopefully throughout the show, as we talk about examples of collective advocacy at the school board level, that that, would, that will pique your interest. And hopefully we can challenge you to start gathering other families, other community members that are interested in making change in our education system. So let us continue on here. You might have seen this post on my Facebook page, and I said, when's the best time to go to a school board meeting? If you know the answer, type it in. <laughs> and the answer is before you have to. So sometimes we are put in the position where we just have to take a concern and issue up past the principal, past the special ed director. Um, and maybe we've already tried those and we haven't been successful, right? And so there are times when we're going to have to go to a school board meeting when it's immediate issue. However, it really helps if we as parents and community people can start building relationships with our school board members now before there is this big issue, right? Um, and so I would encourage you, and we'll talk a little bit in our show about gathering a group of friends and how we can make an impact at the school board level just by going there, not, not even necessarily speaking at the beginning, but just being there to develop those relationships. Hey, Karen, how are you? Um, so let us continue on here. that um, they're doing something that's appreciated by the public. So there might be something that you want to go and show your gratitude, appreciation to the school board. Look at all these trailblazers we have. Anne-Marie, Abby, nice to see you ladies. Kind of see you virtually, right? 
Another reason you might want to go to a school board meeting is because often there will be some kind of a student presentation. Sometimes the high school, you know, take the high schools take turns and we'll have, you know, maybe their debate team come and accept their award from the school district or students might be speaking about issues that they're concerned with. So to so show support for students, that might be another reason why you would want to go to a school board meeting. And then the one that we're going to talk most about today is for us to be listeners and observers at school board meetings, because just by attending them, you can really find a lot of information out about the politics of the district. You know, who really makes decisions? Um, maybe some, you know, control issues that you see among the school board members. All of that are is helpful information for when you have to appear before the school board and, um, you know, speak at a public comment time and talk about some important issues at the district level. So if we look at what you can do individually, I, I thought of this song last night. I don't know how many of you remember Three Dog Nights. One is the loneliest number. <laughs> Let me know in the comments if you know what song I'm talking about. But it says one is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. And guess what? Even if you bring a friend to a school board meeting, two can be as bad as one. It's the loneliest number since the number one. <laughs> So when we look at individual advocacy, what we see is it really creates change just for your child, just for the one child that the parent is speaking up for. The other caution I have is, you know, we think we're making, we're setting a precedent by our child being included in general ed classrooms. And we think, great, now the parents coming after us, they also will have the opportunity for their child to be included in general ed. But guess what? Unless there is a consistent line of people behind you advocating for the same thing, that trail that we blaze can grow over very quickly. Um, and that's one of the concerns when we advocate just for our own child. Um, the other, oops, saying hi again. <laughs> wow, Andrea loves that song, good. <laughs> um, so the other concerns that we have with individual advocacy is pretty much you're left to advocate by yourself. Um, you're doing most, if not all, the preparation. Um, you might have a friend or an advocate helping you, but you are doing a lot of the work to get ready for IEP meetings, figuring out how you're going to, you know, present, you know, your child's needs and strengths so they can see that they can be included and be successful in class, in general ed classes. Um, you're doing a lot of that work by yourself and that, that can be really energy draining, don't you think? Um, the other thing is there's so many parents that, you know, don't have the time that some of us do, don't have the energy, the resources, the knowledge of how our education system works. I know we've talked in the past about parents from other cultures where it, it's not respectful to question authority, to ask questions at an IEP meeting. And so all of those parents are left out of the benefits, the, the outcomes of your individual advocacy. It doesn't spread to anyone else. It's like, just focus on your child. And I know some of you in the audience have had that kind of experience and it is a very lonely time, right? Um, 
and usually it will learn, you know, yield burnout. <laughs> and that's something that is really critical for us to be aware of um, because that really affects not only ourselves, but our families when, when we reach that burnout point. So the solution is collective advocacy. And when we gather other people and we're talking about other community members, um, educators, because there's a lot of educators that want to see change, um, local business people. We want to gather a collection <laughs> of people that can generate some new ideas, that can share the workload, and create change that's really going to last. So that's my hope is that each of you will look at what are some ways that I can engage in collective advocacy and especially at the school board level. So the difference with collective advocacy is the, the outcome, the solution is gonna be felt by many students, not just your child. When we have collective advocacy, the system has to change. It's not, you know, one parent at a time advocating, but the system is on notice that yes, there are a lot of students that are impacted and the system is the one that needs to change. With collective advocacy, we see that the chain is gonna, change is gonna be um, even more sustainable. The advocacy workload is shared, which is really nice. <laughs> and the other families, the other students that are marginalized, they're not going to be left out when we have collective advocacy, because we're also going to be sharing their voices, even if they're physically not with us. Um, so that I think is one of the biggest, you know, outcomes and possibilities that we see is that other families will have their voice heard also. So when we look at these advantages, it makes us think, yes, <laughs> this is a good thing for us to do. Well, remember when I said, what's the best time to go to a school board meeting before you have to go? Um, the idea is that we start developing relationships with school board members, the superintendent, administrators that are at board meetings. And so one of your first steps is just to gather a few friends and go to a school board meeting together. Um, I know one of the strategies that a lot of parents have used is to, um, have a group of volunteers that are going to go to school board meetings and people sign up like, you know, I'll go to the May board meeting, you can sign up for the June board meeting. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to attend each and every board meeting. Of course, you're welcome to do that. Um, but it's a way to distribute that workload. Um, and so that can be something that you think of. As you are listening along today, let me know what are some of your experiences attending school board meetings. Um, and if you have any strategies that you've seen other parents use, that parents in your district have used for collective advocacy, um, share those. So Anne-Marie is from South Carolina. I hope your weather's okay there. Um, she said, interesting idea. Yeah. So we want to, to be at school board meetings and at the beginning, just to be that observer and see how things actually work. Um, one of the things that you can do is have a friend find out some background information about each board member and superintendent. Um, and when you find that, when you find that information out, it's going to be helpful because you're going to start seeing what kind of connections maybe you already have with some of the school board members or the superintendent. 
um, because the relationships are going to be the part that make collective advocacy an effective strategy to use. So by knowing a little bit about maybe the business that the school board member, you know, the job that they have, um, a little bit about their family. Sometimes um, they might have students in the district. You might see how, you know, if they've ever brought up concerns about how things are going, look at the superintendent. You know, if your superintendent is new, see if you can find out information from the previous school district, what they were like. Um, so yeah, you can do a number of things. So Abby says to make change, we must have a group of people with and without disabilities. Yes. And that's one of the things is, um, that we want to look at global education issues that are not going to be considered, oh, special ed issues and that special group of parents um, that are complaining. Instead, when we look at bigger issues like universal design for learning is one of my favorites, um, we can get a lot of parents rallying behind that. We can get teachers that are excited with us trying to see for the school board to make universal design for learning a policy that is implemented in all the schools. We can certainly find community members that want to have graduates that are, you know, good problem solvers and independent thinkers and things like that. So I would say, you know, if there's not an immediate issue, try to pick a concept, a theme that would be more global and outside of what people usually see as um, special ed issues. And Anne says, I've never attended any meetings, but I keep seeing information shared with presentation ideas. Yeah, so, you know, and some school boards are still having virtual meetings, so you can attend that way. Most live school board meetings are also, um, streamed either on a face, you know, a district Facebook page or something like that. So if you miss the meeting in person, you can go back and, um, you know, view the, the recording of the live stream. It's just like everything. I think we, it's richer <laughs> information when we can be there in person. Um, and Abby says, I'm going to have to try that approach that um, she's attended a few meetings, but never for this reason. Yeah, so that's the, the thing that I think helps is to start going when there's nothing that you have <laughs> to complain about <laughs> and let them get to know you as, um, you know, an interested parent in the district. When you typically typically go to school board meetings. Um, there's few people in the audience. There might be, you know, if the football team took a trophy, the parents of the football players will probably be there. The football players would be there. Um, but for typical school board meetings, you rarely see many people. Some school districts require principals to attend meetings, so you'll see them at the school board meeting. Um, if your town has a local newspaper, you'll usually see the newspaper reporter there. Um, the school board will most likely have their attorney that works for the school district present at school board meetings in case there's any legal questions that have to be asked. But other than that, there's rarely any parents that go. So, um, when you go, it will be kind of a novel <laughs> situation and that's okay. And that would still be a good thing for us to, to experience. So we're going to look for some background information, try to get, you know, maybe your kids go to the same ranch for horseback riding lessons, see what you can find in common with some of the board members and the superintendent. So when you're there, 
again, this is when there's not some immediate issue you have to address, but be an observer and a listener. Um, you want to get a meeting agenda. You can usually get that ahead of time from the school district's website. They'll usually have printed copies of the agenda when you get to the room where the meeting is. So pick one of those up. You want to try and get there a few minutes before the meeting is going to start because that's when people are still kind of chit-chatting. And you want to introduce yourself to the board members, the superintendent, other administrators that are there. And you want to use that time to start developing relationships with them. You also want to notice who's in the audience. And I, like I said earlier, sometimes it's not many people there, but you want to be able to identify those people. And as you come back to other school board meetings, you get to see who are the regulars, who are some new people there. Um, and so that just helps you get kind of a flow of the meetings. I think it's important to watch people's body language. So when you're at the meeting in person, you can do that a lot easier than when you're trying to watch a virtual meeting. Um, but you're trying to kind of figure out who these people are, how they think, what their priorities are. Um, so looking at body language, we know, can tell you a lot. And you also want to observe and see what the public comment process is like. Now, all the school boards will have, um, generally, I guess, a uh, time when the public can make comments. And sometimes it will be you can only make a comment about what's on the agenda. Sometimes you can only make a comment about what's not on the agenda. So you want to scope out the rules. Um, and by having some extra people with you, somebody can do that. I mean, it doesn't be it, it's not like each parent has to do all of this individual research, but you do want to know what the policy is for your school district. And if you're at a school board meeting and there are public comment, notice, you know, the, the procedure. Usually you have to sign in before the meeting starts, write down your name, the topic that you want to talk about. There's usually a time limit for each person, two to three minutes. So you want to practice ahead of time and make sure, you know, what you're going to say falls within that time limit. Um, there are times when, you know, another parent can sign up and they can yield their time to you if you need more than the two or three minutes. Um, so you just want to see all those nuances and how that works in your school district. Um, and right now you're being an observer. You're not necessarily speaking right yet, but you want to be familiar. And that really helps you, I think, be more confident. Hey, Corey and Corey, I hope you guys are okay in Alabama with all that weather. Um, Corey says certain districts for the State Board of Education are being elected in May. We we be asked individuals to email and post questions about special ed topics, teacher shortages, for example. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, if you look at, and again, you can find this information on your website, but Corey, thanks for bringing that up because most school dis school boards have staggered times, you know, that people are serving. So not everybody is up for re-election at the same time. And, you know, potentially you'd have a whole new slate of board members that aren't familiar with the district. Um, but use this time in the springtime to connect with people. So I love that idea, Corey. Um, there are sometimes teacher organizations, parent organizations that will have um, school board member forums and you can go and ask specific questions, find out what the candidates, um, what their position on, is on different things. Um, when we're looking at collective advocacy, what would be nice is educators and parents working together 
and sponsoring, you know, a combined school board candidate forum. Um, and yeah, look at topics that are specific to what you're interested in, but also look at topics that impact everyone in the school district, like teacher, you know, shortages, right? So yeah, thanks, Corey. That's a good idea. Um, so again, we are looking and observing <laughs> right now. And it really helps, I think, if you go to at least a couple school board meetings before you make a comment, just so you feel comfortable with the process. Um, and so that would be a tip that I would give. Um, you also want to learn where to find copies of board policies, because now if you're thinking of, you know, we're going to start talking about universal design for learning at school board meetings, you want to see what kinds of instructional school board policies are, um, you know, enacted in your district. Again, sometimes you can find those local board policies on your school district's website. If not, you can call the central administration office and ask if there's a specific link. Um, it's much easier, of course, if you can find them electronically. Um, back in my day when I was a teacher, I would go to our school library and we had like this thick notebook on school board policies. And I was one that always checked that little book out. <laughs> But now you can get most of those things online. So that makes it better, a little bit easier, right? And again, the whole idea of going before you have a critical issue to talk about is that you're developing those relationships with the board members. The other thing, you know, I talked about looking at body language. The other thing to notice when you're at school board meetings is look at the interaction between the superintendent and board members. Um, even look how people are seated. <laughs> and, you know, if, if they have the main school board members, you know, kind of on this platform and maybe the superintendent and the attorney are off on a side table. Maybe they're sitting up there with them. Um, see how many school board members are actively listening when the superintendent talks or are some school board members kind of turning the superintendent off and not really paying attention. All these little things <laughs> add up for you to know how things are working in your school district and who's really got the power, who's really making those um, decisions, because that kind of inside information is what you need to gather. Also look at which school board members are asking questions, who's taking notes, who's really paying attention, who's falling asleep. <laughs> Um, which school board members, vote, you know, voice their opinion and which just kind of pretty much rubber stamp whatever the majority says. And the reason you want to do this is because as we look at, you know, bringing a specific issue to the school board, we want some way of knowing which school board members would probably want to read something or have paper that they can jot down notes on, you know, next to the article that you shared with them. See which school board members really would rather have a verbal conversation. Um, and they're not that interested when somebody projects slides with a lot of data. Um, look at the school board members who might have, you know, like I said, children in the school district, grandchildren in the school district. and and ones that maybe you can touch with um, a personal story. Because we're gonna be talking about, there's a variety of ways that we want to bring up our issues and concerns. And we, the more we know about the individual board members, the more we can tap into their learning style. Um, and so that's something that I would also encourage you to do. Now, 
there are going to be times when it's like, Charmaine, <laughs> all of this is great, but we have an immediate issue. Um, and if you've been following my posts on my Facebook page, you know that I've been giving you updates on what's happening in Billings, Montana. Not that you <laughs> are necessarily going to be moving to Billings and you want to find everything out, but it's a great case study of um, the community and the collective advocacy that has just recently been happening in Billings School District and the lessons that we can learn from that. Um, and so, as I said, there's going to be times when, you know, it's like we have a couple days and we need to pull people together. We need, you know, some other ideas besides just the parents going to the school board meeting. Hey, Lisa, she says, great idea. Kim from Iowa. I hope you're doing well, Kim. Um Karen, I like, thanks for being honest. She said, all of this sounds pretty people-y. I'm going to start going because it's important, but I'm not going to promise to like it. I know. And that's okay, Karen. And that's where, you know, when you have a group of people that can do things, your skill set might be like, you know, I'd rather not have to go there and talk to these people. Your skill set might be collecting data or, you know, finding the school board policy that relates to the issue that you want to, you know, the group wants to talk about. Um, and yeah, so if you can find Karen, some other, some other people that want to share going to the school board meeting duty, you could do that too, where you only occasionally go. Um, but thank you for being <laughs> willing to try it. Let us know how it works. Corey says attending local board of education meetings has been very important in understanding the not so obvious working of the school administration. Yes, Corey. Um, and that's, that's those kind of inside scoops. And that's, again, why you want to have a larger group of people that you're working with. Um, because if your issue is one that a lot of teachers in the district also support, get to know those teachers. If they've been in the district very long, they can tell you some good inside information about how things really work. Um, and, you know, we typically think that the school board, you know, it's above the superintendent. Sometimes what we see in school districts is the superintendent really is the one that is pushing information, su making suggestions, and the school board is looking to the superintendent for that advice. Um, so maybe it's the superintendent that you need to develop more relationships with. Hey, Aaron. Um, Corey says, yes, inside scoop. That's what we like. Corey said, oh, yeah, you're the one that has a board meeting tonight, is giving green cards to people who have comments about only what is on the agenda. I think it, I will be approved, but it's allowed to filter people like that. Well, and that's the thing, Aaron. That's why you want to look at, you know, so I don't know if you have time between now and, and your meeting tonight, but to go to the school district's website and you should be able to find the school board policy, um, public comment, public input. Or the other thing you could do is you could call the central office and talk to the secretary of the superintendent and say, you know, I, I'm new to this. I, you know, I'm trying to figure out exactly how this works. I'm not sure why certain people are going to be given green cards. And, you know, can you point me to the policy that speaks to, pub, you know, the practice of public comment? Um, so, so they're giving green cards to people who have comments only about what's on the agenda. So, yeah. And, and like I said, you also want to look at what their sign-in sheet is like, because sometimes if, um, you know, you just write, you know, 
UDL. I want to talk about universal design for learning. And everybody else there is also signing up to talk about UDL. Sometimes the school board will say, to cut off public comments, they'll say, well, we already heard five speakers talk about UDL, so we're going to move on and close public comment now. So sometimes another strategy is to make right in there for the topic that you're going to talk about a specific point that you're going to make about UDL. And if you can choreograph with the people beforehand, you want to make sure that everybody is trying to make a different point, not the same point brought up again and again, because that's another time that the school board could close the public comment session. Um, so, yeah. And... And Marie says she can't wait to learn how it goes. So Aaron, yeah. So if you can keep us up to date on how your school board meeting goes tonight, that would be cool. We would like to see that. Um, so again, there are going to be times when, you know, it's like we're go. <laughs> you know, this is the school board meets in a couple of days and we got to get this together. So there are times that you, these are the times that you really want to have that wider circle of allies. Um, and as much as that can be, you know, brought together before the special board meeting happens, the better prepared and more confident you will be when you are at the board meetings. So let's look at who are some of the people besides parents with kids with disabilities that we can um, consider our allies and start collaborating with? Um, this is from Pete Wright, and he talks about if you're just one person talking, you're going to be considered a fruitcake. And if you have a second person go with you to a board meeting or something like that, you're going to be, what? two people, <laughs> two people and a fruitcake. <laughs> um, and you can be easily dismissed then. If you have three people going, you're probably going to be kind of labeled the troublemakers. <laughs> and when there's five people that get together and go to school board meetings, ah, now when there's five people in the audience, you're starting to get the school board's attention. If the school board looks out and there's 10 people in the audience, yep, you will probably have them approach you before and after the meeting and want to talk to you some more. If you have a group of 25 people at a school board meeting, all of a sudden, instead of being troublemakers, you're like, oh, our dear friends. <laughs> and if you can get 50 or more people to work together, you have a powerful organization that is on its way to making systemic change, which is what we want. So who are these people that can be our allies that we can gather together? Well, we've said it before, families with and without disabled children. The issues that we're bringing before the school board impact all students in the district, all staff in the district. So we want to include all families as much as possible also within our group. Neighbors. Think of your neighbors and do they have kids going to the same school that your child's going to? Would they be interested in hearing some of the, um, you know, information and would they be interested in helping with this unified issue that you're going to be bringing up? The other thing we can also look at as far as who can be helpful if I can see my screen, our teachers. Sometimes as parents, we think we just 
kind of have disagreements with teachers, but there are a lot of teachers in favor of things like inclusive education. There are a lot of educators that are interested in having the district have a uniform, you know, professional development and peer coaching all around universal design for learning. So whatever your topic is that you're rallying people around, look to the educators because they can be helpful information. And like we said, give you some inside scoop. Um, we also want to make sure we have self advocates. So this is not just a time for parents to be talking. This is a time for our children to also uh, be giving input and sharing their stories with school board members. So make sure you've got self advocates that will be speaking. And other students, um, like in Billings, Emily Pennington, the student that was trying to petition the board for her to have a senior year at the high school, a lot of her classmates came to the school board meetings recently and spoke up. So that can be really helpful. And again, more self-advocates. We have to start listening more to the self-advocates um, because they're the voice that really makes the difference. We can also look at, um, let's see, College professors, if you have a university or a college close to your community, a lot of times they will get involved and be helpful. Local business owners, even, um, oops, I keep hitting the wrong one. Even other school board members, depending on what the issue is, you can also, through your relationships, right, um, have them on board and helping to make the change. Look at administrators in the district. Which administrators are supportive of your efforts? Have them come and be part of the group that's working for change. And then also we look at more students <laughs> um, because they're the voice that really matters. And um, it's helpful for school board members to not only hear from adults. So let's look here. Corey has a question. She says, I'd love to hear from those systems who are required to have a local special ed advisory um, panel. In Alabama, a panel is only required at the state level. Is it helpful to have a local CEP at Alabama State Board of Education? You can make public comments on an item listed on the agenda. Problem is finding the agenda or finding time to make a trip to the Capitol, yeah. Um, so that's the thing under the federal law States are required to have some kind of a state level special ed advisory council. Um, but the federal law doesn't say that each school district has to have one. So it sounds like in Alabama, the only requirement is to meet that federal you know, requirement of having one at the state level. And then it's up to individual districts. Some state regs will say each district needs to have their own special ed advisory council. Um, my personal and professional <laughs> opinion is I would rather see parents join other existing um, district committees and be on those versus that special interest group over here on the side. I think that just perpetuates those silos of, you know, special ed is over here. And if you have a child on a, you know, IEP, you go to these meetings. All the other parents <laughs> go to the PTA meetings. Um, or there's, you know, like accountability meetings on the district level. There's you know, other kinds of curriculum planning meetings on the district level. I would much rather see parents spend their time and energy on those kinds of committees versus any separate special committee. Um, but I know there are districts that use the 
district level advisory committee and people in that group of people have been able to, you know, have some, you know, collaborative conferences together that they offer, you know, the families in the district, things like that. Um, but yeah, let us know the rest if you are here with us live or watching the replay, what is it like in your state? Do you just have the state level advisory committee that parents are on for special education? Or do you also have some district levels? And Aaron says, thank you. I'm newish to the term UDL, but we'll make the suggestion. They are not using inclusive practices. I'm hoping to give testimony um, to our family's experience. Yes, and that those personal stories make a huge difference. Um, and so I think that would be great for you to, to do that. Um, Anne says, I'm seeing Parent Advisory Council starting up in South Carolina, but it seems like the director of special ed is using it to gather information for change. I'm looking into this also. Yeah, see, you know, like I said, different ones operate differently. What my fear is, is it's going to be token parent input that like doesn't go anywhere. And, you know, we think as parents that we're involved in making change, but sometimes it's, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, I feel like sometimes to the districts, it's like dividing conquer. <laughs> let's put all these parents on these, you know, this special ed committee and get them over here and they can complain there. And, you know, we'll try to appease them at that committee level. Um, so yeah, I, I have some bias against those separate committees. And Ann says UDL and co-teach are included on our state education website, but not put into practice. I guess it sounds good to use the buzzwords, but not important enough to implement. Yeah, and that's something that you can also use is, and I know um, there were some people in Billings that, that used this when they made their public comments to the school board. Look at what the mission is for your school district. How many of us have read, the, read those mission statements? Go to the school district's website. You'll find their mission, their value statements. Um, and that those words can be used to say, you know, this is what our district believes. This is what I'm seeing actually happens. How can we make sure that we get closer to what that mission is for our district? for all students. Um, but yeah, and that's, you know, that's one of those things and that I think would, you know, co-teaching universal design for learning would be things that a lot of teachers would also support. And that's what you want to try and find is a variety of people that are going to speak at the, at the board meeting. Um, Aaron says, SEAC helped me connect with other parents in our area with the same issues. Yeah, so that can be an advantage of it, right? Um, and then, you know, keep those relationships going with those parents outside of your SEAC meetings and then see, you know, is this that and maybe the SEAC committee does a presentation for the school board because that could happen too, right? Um, Abby says it's only required in state level in Kentucky. And Kim says she thinks it's only state level in Iowa. Um, Corey says, good point. I'm on a state C app and it's feeling very check the box to let fe federal regulations. We made suggestions, but who knows where it goes from there. Yeah. And so if you're on a committee like that, you know, I think it's maybe time to rethink, is this the best way I can use my time and energy? Because all of, all of our time <laughs> is limited. And so we really want to pick and choose what we think we have the potential, you know, where we have that potential to make a difference. Um, and Ann says, there's a state level pack and now districts are starting 
the local or the district packs in South Carolina. Yeah. So like I said, you can, you can check it out, but, um, you know, usually on those special ed advisory committees, there's some kind of an administrator. There's some representation from special ed teachers. There's parents. They usually will make up the majority of the committee, but you don't have the rich um, circle of allies that I think is really important. And so that's, yeah. <laughs> Aaron says, run for school board. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, and Karen says, yeah, see, being a special education parent is bankrupting me, not just financially, but the investment of time is unbelievable. Yeah, it's, um, and that's that's the beauty of having other people to work with um, because you can split up because, you know, I think as parents, a lot of times we're researching things, right? We're looking up, what does the law say? We're looking up, you know, what is the district policy on that? You know, we're writing out our, our vision statements. We're trying to, you know, there is are lots of pieces there that we're working on. And one thing that we do in our... Um, in our trailblazer group is share vision statements, share, you know, templates of letters that we can write because as much as we can, you know, look at and piece together things that other people have done and not reinvent the wheel ourselves, that can help with time. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a time consuming position to be in. Anne-Marie said, one of the reasons we have PTSD. Yeah, it's, it's real. And um, that's something that we need to really be tuned into. And it can be really challenging. Um, because then it's almost like every, you know, IEP meeting can be that trigger. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's something that we certainly have to be aware of and and address with each other and support each other with things like that, right? So these people that you're going to be inviting to work together with you, they can help with some of the tasks. And that's where you find out, you know, who loves being on social media? Well, have that person be in charge of your social media postings about what your group is doing. You know, who loves to look up state regs and rules? Put that person in charge of looking and researching. Um, so you're not having to do it all by yourself. Here are some things that whoever likes doing research can find out. One is your state's open meeting law and your state's Freedom of Information Act. Because, one, you want to make sure that school boards are making decisions publicly and not making decisions in private. So that open meeting law in your state is important to know. Two, you're probably going to have to be asking for some district um, records, documents, and you want to know about your state's Freedom of Information Act. So assign somebody in your circle of allies to figure those things out. And on the same hand, you also want to be looking at what your district's open meeting policy is. Um, and especially that public comment section, right? You also want to know what your district's public records request policy is and the forms. And it's like, oh my God, Charmaine, it's like, why do I want to do all? And you don't have to do all of this. You can have someone else in your group figure these things out. But especially when you're requesting records and documents from the school district, not your child's records, but district, you know, documents, policies, whatever, most district will have districts will have a specific record form that you need to fill out and date and turn in. And so again, you want to follow all those specific steps that they outline. 
or else sometimes they like throw out your request because you didn't use the right form, you didn't sign and date it. So just make sure that somebody in your group is, is sharing that information. Um, we've talked about finding out your district's public comment policy. And also the other thing that you'll want to, your group will want to be doing is looking at board issues that pertain to the issue that you're going to be taught, that your group is going to be talking about. Um, in Billings, Montana, they looked at the school board policy for, you know, students with IEPs aging out of the district's program. They looked at state um, policies that Montana had just passed last spring. So there is a certain amount of research and you want to find those people that like doing research <laughs> to help you out with these things. And when you are when you are planning who's going to say what at the school board meeting from your group, you want to look at the most probable objections that you're going to get. And so anybody in the comments know what would be one common objection that school boards have when um, groups want to make a change in the district? How about money? <laughs> so if there is any cost to the suggestion that your group is making for a change in the district, and most likely the suggestions you're going to be making and advocating for are going to have some type of money connected with them, some kind of funding. Um, so ahead of time, you want to figure out, is there a way that you can do a cost estimate? Because if it's left up to the school administrators, they are most, yeah, and Tiffany said budget, yeah. They are, if it's left up to the district to, you know, figure out the cost, they're usually going to go with the worst case scenario, and that's going to be a costly price tag. And that may cause some school board members not to be in favor of what your group is wanting, you know, to change. So find somebody in your group that likes to work with money and figuring those things out um, because that person could present what the costs would be to the school board. So at least they have another, um, you know, cost analysis to, to consider. And the other thing that school boards are afraid of and superintendents don't like is it's going to set a precedent. So if we're changing to all teachers are implementing universal design for learning, does that mean there's not room for anything else or, you know, exactly the school board members are going to be a little leery of creating that systemic change. They would rather <laughs> have parents individually ask for things that um, instead of district-wide. So be prepared for how you can um, speak to the precedent. And you might say this is actually a positive precedent because it's going to help all students. It's not just going to help once you know, specific group. And then, you know, another objection that you hear is the school board members just need more time to think about it. Um, and sometimes this is true, right? They just had a lot of new information and they need time to think about it. Sometimes the need more time is more of an excuse to kind of put you off. But the other thing you have to look at is if you're proposing some kind of a new district policy, most school districts will have where that change in the policy has to come up at three cons you know, consecutive school board meetings, be discussed, be looked at again um, before final approval comes. So um, you also want to know the timing of how things can 
can be put through. Now, at the Billings, Montana School Board meeting the other night, it was interesting because the chair of the school board did not vote in favor of the option where students could continue on in high school after age 19. However, she did share this kind of like Robert's rules of order where at the next school board meeting, they could have a vote to say, you know, do we need to go through all three readings? Can we suspend that rule? So there's all kinds of little intricacies. <laughs> and the more that your group is involved in meetings and attending them, this is the kind of information that you're going to find out. And keep that in your pocket because you might need that at your next meeting. The other thing is the impact on staff. So if we're asking for all the staff to be trained on universal design for learning, um, and we're asking for peer coaching to happen, like how are they going to get those peer coaches to help you know, the teachers implement UDL? Are, do they have people in place that can do that now? Are they going to have to hire you know, some facilitators to make that peer coaching happen so teachers actually implement the new concept <laughs> with fidelity? So think of things like that to, um, because they're going to have questions like that. So the more that we can kind of divide up people in our group to say, you speak about the money issue, you speak about, you know, the impact on staff, you speak about this. So we divide it up and we address their objections before they actually have time to voice them. So that, that can be a really helpful strategy too. Um, and Ann says, wow, great tip to learn about the school board meetings. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a whole nother animal, right? It's like, whoa, this is pretty interesting. So earlier today, we talked about kind of trying to see if we can figure out the type of learner that the school board members are. And people that ask a lot of data questions from the school board level, those are people that we want to give data to, right? Um, there are some school board members that, oops, um, aren't really interested in research, but personal success stories, personal stories about how things can be so much different. And when your child had a teacher that was using co-teaching and universal design for learning, how much richer your child's education was that year. So some people want data, some people want more personal stories. Some school board members are going to be more cautious about, well, legally, can we really do this? Or if we don't do it, will we be in trouble? Um, and a lot of times superintendents are the one that are kind of put in that role of keeping track of legal issues of course, with consulting with their attorney. Um, but you can also bring up legal issues in your presentations to the school board, and you can remind them <laughs> of what some of the federal laws say. Um, and that will perk some interest, and some other school board members probably won't listen to that. The other aspect that you can bring up is the social justice issue. And how our district needs to change. Our district needs to look at um, all of our students and the education that they're receiving and how many students are marginalized and not getting the education that they deserve. So appealing to their social justice um, part of their being can be a way that you influence school board members. So just like we want teachers to have a variety of ways to teach our kids things, we want to have, our group wants to have a variety of ways to help the school board learn and understand the issue that we're talking about. Um, so again, this is um, 
something that's important. And again, how you want to maybe divide up some of your speakers about the issues and different speakers can address different aspects. Um, and by using all of these tools like research, personal stories, bringing up the legal issues, social justice, um, by using all of those, you're going to probably touch um, on each school board member in one of those areas. So let me know if that makes sense. And let's look. So got to get our ducks in the row. Can't have a, a presentation without at least one giphy, right? So how do we get our ducks in the row again? We have that variety of voices at the school board meetings. We touch, we gather our group members and each person can talk on a different point. Sometimes you can give suggestions for the people that are gonna be speaking at the school board meeting and you can suggest that they start with a, did you know kind of quote, like, did you know that, you know, I don't know, 60% of our teachers haven't ever had any professional development on universal design for learning. Or you can start your presentation to the school board with a shocking statistic of, you know, how many students in our district that are in self-contained special ed rooms ever leave that self-contained room and become included in general ed. The shocking statistic is probably very few. <laughs> you could start your presentation with an intriguing story. You could use a quote. So you can give people in your group ideas of how they can start their presentation. And you always want to be able to have some kind of a solution to give. So you're not there just complaining, but that you're also providing ideas for solutions. And then one of our last points is how do we build momentum? How do we keep that momentum going? Um, because when an issue is taking several months, are we going to have people show up? every school board meeting or are people going to start dwindling so one of the things that you can do is make sure you have time to celebrate with your group so you know maybe you go out after a school board meeting and go to your local fast food restaurant and you know <laughs> and take a lot of the tables up in the restaurant and talk about the school board meeting and congratulate each other on things that went well and have that come up camaraderie is really important with your group. If, um, like I said, if you have a local newspaper, getting the local newspaper to write a story about what the concern is, is a great way to keep the momentum going, to keep people in the community aware of what's happening. So talk to the reporters that are at school board meetings. There's usually a reporter there. Talk to them, give them your point of view. Um, you know, people have done things like make bucket buttons. <laughs> I remember when I was teaching and um, the teachers were kind of having a protest. And one of the things that the teachers were doing were, you know, we were making buttons. So that was a way to show unity. You know, some people will do everybody wear blue tonight at the board meeting. And that's another way to have this identity that, yes, I have a group of people that are supporting me. So you can look at fun things like that to do, too, to keep the momentum going. And, of course, in this day and age, social media, right? Find somebody in your group that likes to be on Facebook, that likes to be on Instagram. Um, you can make a Facebook page, a Facebook group a private group for your um, for the group that you're working with. And that's how you stay in touch with people. But yeah, there's got to be ways that we keep that momentum going also. Because when we know with, you know, what we know about individual advocacy is, you know, it's change only for one child. That trail that you blaze can grow over very quickly. You're left to advocate by yourself. 
And there are other parents that are left out that don't have the time, energy, resources, the knowledge of the education system to advocate. So that's why we want to look at collaborative advocacy and the benefits of that. And hopefully today you got some new ideas or some tips. And I got to remember, I don't know, there might be, um, I think a lot of you probably have my book. <laughs> but let's see. If you win the book, I'll still send it to you and you could share it with another parent. It's called The Art of Advocacy, A Parent's Guide to a Collaborative IEP Process. So what I do is I close my eyes and I'll scroll through the comments and then stop on one. And that will be the person that wins the copy of the book. So I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling and stop. Where did I stop? <laughs> Corey. All right, Corey. Um, and you might have a copy of my book, but I'll send it anyway, <laughs> and you can share it with another parent. So congratulations, Corey. Good, good, good. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you for, you know, contributing your stories and suggestions and ideas, because this Facebook group is a way that we can engage in collaborative advocacy. Um, I also wanted to tell you, although a lot of our trailblazers are here, if you are interested in being in our monthly trailblazer group, we also look at individual advocacy and helping each other. And we even have um, members in our group that will virtually attend each other's meetings. So it's not quite individual advocacy, but you have support from another parent. Um, and we brainstorm ways that we can make that systemic change. So if you're interested in that membership, you can go to iep.today forward slash parent trailblazer membership. We are here every Thursday and we will be back next Thursday. Um, it will be a general Q&A time. So you can bring up any topic, any questions that you have, and the whole show will be devoted to our audience's questions. So I hope you'll return. And if this was helpful, let us know. Hey, Lisa, she says, great ideas. So thanks for being here, you guys. And we will, I'm trying to manipulate all these buttons here. We will return next Thursday at noon mountain time. So until then.